The name of Sarasate was magical for the violinists. He would enter onto the stage with a long, deliberate stride, in a true Spanish majestic manner and with a phlegmatic demeanor. After that, he started to play with unheard freedom, so rapidly that he crossed the limit which brought the public the greatest delight. This was said by a great violinist and pedagogue, Carol Flesch. The American press was very impressed as well with Sarah Zata's playing. In the words of an American record guide reviewer, Sarah Zata had a style that was emotionally low-key, glib even, and it presented its extreme virtuosity to the listener as though it were nothing remarkable, no drama, no histrionics, but the fleetest fingers and ball arm in the history of recorded sound. Who was Pablo Sarasate, regarded by many composers and fellow musicians of his time as one of the best violinists of the 19th century? Sarasate was not only a great violinist, but also a composer who gave a new depth to the Spanish folklore music and presented it to the world. In this documentary, we will show Sarasate's life, music, and the environment that had a big influence on his composition style. We travel to Pamplona, capital of the Navarra region in the north of Spain. In this city, which is located at the foot of the Pyrenees mountain range, Sarasate was born. Pamplona, or Irunia as locals like to call their city, is the third largest in the greater Basque cultural region. It is home to approximately 200,000 people. Pamplona is noted for the festival of San Fermín. The American author Ernest Hemingway described this festival in his famous novel The Sun Also Rises. Hemingway's book, among others, brought the San Fermín festival to the attention of the world. Today, more than a million tourists flock to Pamplona to experience the running of the bulls. Pablo Sarasate, whose name at birth was Martin Melinton Sarasate Ina Vasquez, was born in the heart of the city. This is the street where Sarasate was born on the 10th of March 1844. He had three sisters, Micaela, Francisca and Maria, who died in infancy. Sarasate's musical talent was quickly discovered. His father, a military bandmaster in the Aragon Regiment, brought him to the finest violin teachers in the area. At the age of seven, Pablo gave his first public performance. The word of this prodigy quickly spread, and a year later he received an allowance by Countess Esposimina to study with the best teacher in Spain, Manuel Rodriguez. Together with his mother and two sisters, Pablo moved to Madrid. The violinistic abilities of young Sarasate weren't neglected in Madrid either. In May 1855, Sarasate played for Queen Isabel II, who was in awe with his playing and decided to support him financially so that he could study in Paris. Not long after, Sarasate's mother accompanied him to France. This trip was spread out over several months in which 11-year-old Sarasate gave many concerts in Pamplona and San Sebastian. Just after crossing the border to France, his mother became sick with cholera and died.
Young Pablo was escorted to Paris by the Spanish consul of Bayonne, where he was taken by the administrator of the conservatory, who together with his wife adopted him. It didn't take long for Sarasate to establish his name in Paris. Within two years of studying at the conservatory, he won the first prize in both violin and theory competitions. Music critics were amazed by the accomplishments of the young boy and wrote, Not only does this child play violin like a master, but he is a musician like an angel. He has won a first prize in solfeggio and deciphers everything that is presented to him, as if he had learned it by heart, with perfect taste, with feeling, with style. It took him a decade to get appreciated by the public. During that period, he got offers to teach from the conservatories of Paris and Madrid. But his persistent personality did not allow him to go from his path, to become a virtuoso violinist and composer. Sarasate continued living in Paris, though visiting his hometown Pamplona very frequently. He identified himself more and more as French and kept Paris as his home base from where he would tour all the world. Here, in the heart of Pamplona, is the museum that is dedicated to Sarasat. We meet the curator of the collection, Luis Garabayo. In reality, this museum, this small museum, because it's a large museum, que tampoco tiene mucho tamaño, eh, responde al testamento de Pablo Sarasate, que hizo a finales del de siglo XIX, en el que eh, donaba todos sus bienes de, de la Casa de París al Ayuntamiento de Pamplona, con la obligación de que el Ayuntamiento expusiera todo, toda la donación, todos los eh, cuadros, títulos, eh, regalos que él almacenaba allí, que los expusiera en una sala museo para que él disfrutara la ciudad de Pamplona y los ciudadanos de Pamplona. Eh, además de, los, de todas las condecoraciones y esto que cuento, eh, donó a, la, a Pamplona de dos violines, un bullón y un gan, que se exponen aquí en, también junto con el resto de elementos. La exposición se ha completado con muchísima documentación gráfica que tenemos de su, de su vida, de su época, tanto de fotografías como de obra de pintura, de, de, de dibujos, incluso alguna escultura. Hemos intentado que la exposición tenga un sentido, que me cuenta cronológicamente cuál es la carrera de, de Sarasate. Hay también una relación de toda su obra y se trata especialmente también la relación de Sarasate con Pamplona, porque Sarasate, a pesar de ser un músico francés, entre comillas, porque respondía a la escuela francesa, eh, tiene una relación muy estrecha con Pamplona durante toda su vida y pasaba aquí las fiestas, las famosas pistas de San Fermín, las pasaba, en, en, pasaba unos días en Pamplona, venía todos los años, no faltaba nunca. Bueno, las fiestas de San Fermín ahora son internacionalmente conocidas, sobre todo por los encierros, por la, los encierros que son los toros que van por la calle, que son conducidos hasta la puerta de toros, y por las corridas de la tarde, por la fiesta de los toros. Pero entonces, cuando vivía Sarasate, eh, las fiestas eran muy distintas ahora, no tenían ese cariz tan multitudinario ni eran tan internacionales, y sin embargo la música era muy importante. Los conciertos matinales de la Orquesta Santa Cecilia 
que era la orquesta amateur de Pamplona que Sarasate sostenía, que le acompañaba a él en, en, por, en los conciertos, eran muy importantes y eran, de hecho aparecían en los propios carteles de la, de la fiesta. Hoy en día la fiesta se centra exclusivamente en los entierros, en los toros, en, pues en la alegría de la fiesta, pero el aspecto musical ha quedado, eh, pues, si no en segundo plano, prácticamente desaparecido. Y Sarasate era un, curiosamente era muy aficionado a los toros, a las corridas de los toros, y tenía un apartado, que es un, digamos, unos asientos reservados en la plaza, y todos los días iba a la corrida por las tardes. Sarasate con Pamplona es muy estrecha. Él tenía un gran afecto por Pamplona. Él estaba muy vinculado emocionalmente a su ciudad y era muy generoso con Pamplona. Él hacía posible los conciertos de San Fermín. Él eh, reforzaba la orquesta de Santa Cecilia con músicos que... Que, que, que venían de, de Madrid, de Zaragoza y de otras ciudades para que aquello sonara bien, porque hay que tener en cuenta que la Orquesta Santa Cecilia era una orquesta amateur, no era una orquesta profesional. Y él cuando venía a Pamplona quería que aquello sonara estupendamente, como, una, como él estaba acostumbrado en todos los conciertos que daba por Europa. Y esa generosidad también se extendía a... Bueno, él, él era, donaba eh, cantidades de dinero que... Bueno, a personas necesitadas, por ejemplo, compraba eh, un violonchelo para el, para el violonchelista de la orquesta y era una persona muy generosa. Seguramente también fue una persona muy rica porque él daba muchísimos conciertos todos los años, hacía giras anuales, muchas eran repetidas como la que hacía, por ejemplo, en Inglaterra en verano, en Alemania, y era una persona que hizo una gran fortuna. Y, bueno, eh, parte de ello se puede ver en este museo.
It took about 10 years for Sarasat to get known in the world. It started around 1860, when he started to travel to England from Paris, where he was living at the moment. And then, of course, there was the famous trip which really made him world famous when he went to South and North America. During his trips, especially when he was, was back in Europe, he had one pianist who came along with him. Her name was Bertha Marx. They started to play together from around 1870, 1875. The first entry, which I know of that they played together, was actually in Pamplona. And we can see that from around 77 to 1880, she became the pianist of Sarasota. Together they played 700 concerts in around 30 years. And they were basically traveling all the time throughout Europe, uh, Russia, England, America, of course. There is a very famous trip of them where they were invited to play in America in 1889. And they played 100 concerts in three months. This was together with Eugène Dalbert, the pianist. Uh, they were sharing the, the concerts. Osara Zate had one manager throughout his life. That was Otto Goldschmidt. Otto Goldschmidt was uh, a pianist who really wanted to hear him in Germany in 1870. Uh, Sarazate invited him to Wiesbaden where he had to play a concert and somehow got in trouble because he didn't get the amount of money which he should have gotten. And Otto Goldschmidt was there next to him and helped him to get the right amount of money, which was half of the tickets that were sold during the concert. That Instance and others made Otto Goldschmidt to, to become his concert manager for the rest of his life. And basically afterwards, because also uh, he became the executor of the will of Sarasat in 1908 after Sarasat passed away. Otto Goldschmidt got married with the, the pianist Bertrand Marx in 1894, and with the, the three of them and a really cute little dog, which was called Bebol. They traveled for around 30 years together. To speak as a pianist about the music of Sarazate is of course, in a way, a bit funny. Because Sarazate is known for his fantastic virtuosic pieces for the violin, not for the piano. The piano is often regarded as an accompaniment to the music that he wrote for the solo instrument. But the question is what one does with that accompaniment as a pianist. One can just play as it is written or one can find certain things. And what I wanted to find out was what type of instruments could have made the same music if it wouldn't be a piano. And in Spain, 
there are of course many instruments which are regional and traditional. If we, for example, take the the Gota Navarra or the, the Gota de San Fermin, which are pieces for the Navarra region, we can see that he imitated uh, the drums, the gaita, which is a typical type of bagpipe from the north of Spain. And with these instruments, he was, in my opinion, imitating how it really should have sounded if it wouldn't be written for the piano. When I look at the music of Sarazate in that manner, I think it brings more to, to the music itself when I perform it. And it was very important for me to find these things in the music of, of Sarazate because it brings a lot more than just a simple accompaniment. The music of Sarazate comes from a long tradition of culture and many different types of cultures, which is a very interesting thing because Spain is basically a melting pot of many, many, many cultures from starting from the Greeks and the Romans to the Visigoths and of course the Arabs who were occupying Spain for around eight centuries. The north of Spain is completely different than the south of Spain. This has to do with that it's a very big country, but also that people there are very proud of each region where they are from. This has always been there. And it means that the culture, the regional culture, is very strong, which until this day, in my opinion, still is. The music of Spain is very closely linked, of course, to the guitar, which is the, the, the heart of the, of the Spanish musical culture. But there are also many other instruments, which, of course, Sarasate used to imitate with the accompaniment. If we, for example, take a playera, and we hear the castellets, we hear the, the flamenco influences, that is a typical Spanish thing, and I think that these type of elements, which of course Sarazate embedded into his music, is highly important to understand and to see the musical function of this.
Our next stop after Pamplona is the south of Spain. For Sarasate, the region of Andalusia was one of the main inspirations for his compositions. Here we encounter the Moorish influences, the flamenco and the local customs. First of all, flamenco, the name, there are three explanations. For one is comes from the Arabic uh, word felagmengu, which means farmer. Um, there's another one which is uh, linked to the Flemish. Uh, they, called, they are also called flamencos in Belgium. And the third one is from the posture of the flamingo bird. So in some dance positions, they look like a flamingo on one. But none is really proof that this is it. No? But there's three possible theories about it. So flamenco developed uh, quite late through the gypsies who traveled from India to Europe. Flamenco music itself basically are the roots of Indian music later through the big journeys of the gypsies through the Mozarabic countries, Jewish influence, uh, Arab, later Arabic, because they came through Morocco into Spain. They mixed it later with the rich folklore which existed in Spain already. And the guitar was not always in there. The first instruments for flamenco accompaniment was just noise. This is called pitos, finger snipping, or palmas. Yeah, they clapped hands, or they used their knuckles doing noise on tables. Yeah, and also sometimes they just used a glass and knocked it. So that's how they developed the rhythm. The dance also was not yet this hard dancing. Daka 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 because they didn't use shoes, because shoes were much too expensive for gypsies. They danced barefoot, like in the Indian Katak dance. Also, the influence of, in the dance is pure Indian. If you think about the movements from the belt upwards, it's all Indian. And later, this zapateado, which they call, that came much later when they had shoes, before they danced barefoot. What's also interesting to know is that the flamenco has minimum 50 to, some people say even, to 80 different forms. There are some basic forms which are then later have a variation and they became a new form. Uh, one famous form, for example, is the Malagenia. And Malagenia developed basically in Malaga, which in classical music, Sarasate, used for example, other, other cities like the Granada developed a form called Granadina or Granaina. So many forms developed because Spain was a rough country without good roads, without railways yet. So every province and every part of Andalusia uh, developed its own 
form and later they mixed it and became new forms. Flamenco deals with uh, persecution, uh, being poor, uh, but also with love or lost love and so on and so on. Sarasate's playing seduced everybody. One of the most important aspects of his play was almost a childish like spontaneity and immediacy. To my opinion, Sarasate had conquered the word technique by all means. He would play the violin with such an ease that it seemed like he was joking with the public, but also with himself. Eugenie Zai, who was one of the most important composers and violinists of all times, told that Sarasate was the one who taught us violinists how to play clean. It is known that later in his life, Sarasate only practiced when he had to learn a new piece. Or sometimes during the mornings, he would play some trills while he was still in his bed. Of course, this didn't happen at once. He himself commented about this, sarcastically saying, that he had practiced for 37 years, for 14 hours a day, and now people call him a genius. His fame was enormous, and this had something to do not only with his incredible violin play, but also with his charisma. To enhance this, sometimes he would walk to the stage, and just before starting to play, he would almost drop the violin, giving the impression that he is insecure of holding the instrument, leaving the public petrified, and then he would start playing. Once in Amsterdam, the Park Schauber Hall was so full that a couple of hundreds of people couldn't fit in, and because of forcing and pushing, windows got broken. He was called back on stage 15 times and played many encores from his own compositions. 
During the 19th century, there was a great tradition of composing pieces which were inspired from folk music or had roots from folk music. These composers were called regional romantics. Like Brahms, Chopin, Liszt, Dvorak, Sarasate also belonged to this stream. Despite composing many pieces from his mother country, Spain, he also took an interest to other countries, such as Melodia Romana, Aires Escocias, Cantiones Rusas. Also, we shouldn't forget the famous Aires Bohemios, better known as Tigorner Weissen or Gypsy Airs, which just after composing until nowadays became one of the most played and favorite pieces of the violin repertoire. que aunque nacido en Pamplona, eh, Sarasate es un músico de la escuela francesa porque él estudia en el Conservatorio Superior de París, va muy jovencito, muy de niño allí y se educará y se formará y sus amigos serán músicos franceses. Eh, sin embargo, eh, lo que eh, sí eh, de diferencia, por supuesto, del resto de músicos franceses es eh, su origen español y la influencia de, de, la, de, la, de, los, de la música folclórica popular española, de los aires españoles, en todos los músicos que le, que le rodean. Es, él tiene mucha amistad con Saint-Saëns, con Edouard Lalo, con Vimier, con muchos músicos, y en todos ellos eh, la, la influencia de, de, de la música española, de la música popular española, que le introduce en, en, su, en su música, es, es evidente. Y, por ejemplo, eh, con Eduardo Aló, él expresamente, explícitamente declara que la influencia de, de Sarasate en la composición de la Sinfonía Española es eh, clara. Y no solo Sarasate tiene esta influencia, digamos, este, introduce este hispanismo musical en la música francesa, sino que además él, como es un gran artista que tiene una gran penetración en, en el público en popular, porque hay que tener en cuenta que entonces que no existía la amplificación, la música como la conocemos hoy. Sarasate, sin embargo, era un, un artista que llenaba los teatros, los abarrataba y conseguía un efecto muy parecido al del, del, del fenómeno de los fans actual. ¿no? Tal era su éxito que él eh, eh, popularizaba obras de compositores franceses y también europeos o, eh, y las hacía eh, muy conocidas, de tal manera que muchos compositores querían componer música para Sarasate porque era la forma de darla a conocer al público. Es el caso de Max Bruch. Max Bruch compone su primer concepto para el, el otro gran músico de la época, de, que es Joachim, que es un músico alemán, y le compone la primera obra, el primer concepto para violín, se lo dedica a Joaquín. Sin embargo, en su primer viaje a América, que es en 1870, son dos años hasta 1872, 
Sarasate toca ese concierto de grupo de, 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 dedicado a, a Joaquín y lo hace popular, ¿eh? lo populariza. De tal forma que Brook, el segundo concierto para violín, se lo dedicará a Sarasate. Ya, no sé, y esto ocurre eh, mucho, hay muchísimas obras de músicos franceses, y, pero también, como digo, de escoceses, ingleses, dedicadas a, a Sarasate. In 1908, Sarasate passed away in his summer house in Biarritz. He was buried in his beloved hometown Pamplona and will always be remembered for the cultural heritage that he left behind. Until now, he is being honored in Spain, especially in Pamplona, by his fellow countrymen. Thank you. 